Okay, everyone, stand to your feet tall. Put your hands in the air, and here we go. Get ready. Rapture practice, right? Ever heard that one? I had a youth pastor who used to say that all the time, in jest, of course. Though I think he may actually have meant it. Who knows? Pretty sure one does not have to practice for the rapture. But this is serious. Is the rapture real? What is it? When does it take place? Before the tribulation? In the middle? After? Or what? what what's that? Did I just hear a trumpet? Oh, no, wait, that, that was the dog next door. Does Messiah return before, during, or after? Why doesn't the Bible not provide detail, including timing of such a critical prophetic event? Are you kidding? That is unthinkable indeed, because it does when we read it. Most just ignore it. And I am talking about the most famous of pastors. For no man knows the day or hour, right? Right? Messiah continues as he tells us, we remnant believers will know the season, even providing at least two parables that tell us so. But people will be eating, drinking, and merry. They'll be unaware, right? He'll come as a thief in the night. Right, absolutely. People will. But the true ecclesia will know the season and be ready. And who says white men can't dance? Well, he does clearly, right? Can we really go around speculating based on added opinion of, unfortunately, what can be termed inept scholars? The definition of leaven rebuked, really. Not if we want to know the truth, and we find that in the word. For instance, who is this guy? Certainly not the Hebrew Yahusha. When Messiah defines this event and its time, Paul affirms it multiple times, as well as John the Revelator. Even Second Esdras nails it down, we will cover and is the origin of both of those in mindset scripturally, as it came first. Oh, Daniel also deals with this, as does Jeremiah, and we'll cover, and the Qumran scrolls left by the exiled temple priest even define this for us. I mean, the real question is, how can we not know the timing of the rapture and how can we be so misled? And what exactly are they debating as how illiterate to continue such all these years when scripture is so clear on this? We will end this debate and prove there is none. Just a puppet show of willing ignorance Who is the court jester there? Oh, I'm sorry. Let's make this more relevant today. Here is the worship band trying to mimic the behavior of the world. I've been there, done that, and ain't doing it ever again. By the end of these two rapture videos, you are going to know firmly what the Bible says and its timing of the rapture event as well as what it is. And you will find most of the modern church has a view representing strange doctrine, as it simply doesn't match scripture and it better. Is this a different event from the second coming, for instance? Well, what does the Bible say of its timing? And the question is very easy to answer. Or is this a tool, leavening scripture, meant to keep believers apathetic and complacent? When many even say the words, I'm glad I won't be here for the tribulation. Sure, one can attempt to then find every scripture that says believers will be removed from harm. But again, 
Do we even read the whole sentence or the scripture before and after in context to find whether it even tells us when we are removed from harm? You will find most do not do that and the scripture does tell us. But I don't want to go through the zombie apocalypse so we hear. My God would never allow me to suffer. Have those even read scripture at all? This is one of the defining doctrines of the final eagle head of the synagogue of Satan and the Nicolaitans who worship pagan holidays and pagan gods and goddesses. One in which scripture is not silent and truly cannot be misread. We can follow these deceivers throughout history really identifying them by such doctrines, which are against Scripture, as they lead the lambs to slaughter. They even use a scriptural term, left behind, formed the opposite of how it is even used. You'll see, as it is actually good and blessed to be left behind. How about that? Many have requested this over the years, and some may even regret that as these two videos will test the rapture and prove it out, ending debate, because scripture always has. It is time to restore the word, which has always defined the rapture in timing and context. Ladies and gentlemen, the rapture will now be understood. Now we set up that we are going to disprove the modern church view on this, and we'll just come right out and tell you. In this video and the next, with abundant, indisputable scripture, the Bible. Sure, someone will say, but that passage could mean well, no, actually, it can't, because Scripture must agree with Scripture. When testing things like this, we do so from the perspective that the Bible is the only truth. When Daniel says something that appears vague, and Messiah himself then brings up Daniel's words and tells you exactly when, there is nothing vague, and you cannot go backwards and overrule Messiah's interpretation. Oh, well, we see this in scholarship all the time. Can you? If you view the Bible that way, or as allegory, as some say, well, you are going to hate this video. Because we teach believing that the Bible is the foundation of truth as it is. And it's the only thing that vets as such. Now, check out just how much evidence there is on this topic. This is going to be a fairly long video with another comic. This is amazing how much information and data is right there and pretty much all spells out, you got it, exactly when the rapture will happen. Yet we are told in most churches that, well, we don't know when. That the rapture could happen right now. It could happen anytime. Is that really what the Bible says? We'll just come out and tell you right now. No, absolutely not. The Bible is very clear on this topic. It is far too important for the Bible to be absent on it. And it is not. It's very abundant, and you will see now. Let's begin with the accepted Bible canon in this video, and in the next, we'll bring in 2nd Esdras and the Qumran priests while still covering yet more from the modern Bible canon, because there's so much. This is a plethora of information. It's amazing and overwhelming, frankly. Even by the end of the first video here, you will know when the rapture occurs in time, and there will already be enough for many of you. No, not the day nor the hour, and we'll cover that too, but it's order in events indeed, so we can know the season. We aren't saying this. Scripture is. This is its case, and it is so abundant and obvious. These scriptures are right there in doctrinal statements of churches even, teaching the modern view, but... 
They are ignoring every part of every one of these which defines a time. It's like they read the scripture and, you know, oh, there's a time that we have to ignore that. And that's what they're doing. We will not. 2 Thessalonians 2, chapter or verse 1. Now we beseech you, brethren, by the coming of our Lord, Yahushua Messiah, and by our gathering together unto him, that ye be not soon shaken in mind, or be troubled, neither by spirit, nor by word, nor by letter, as from us, as that the day of Messiah is at hand. Now this is mischaracterized in many pulpits, that Paul thought the rapture could happen, well, at any second, any time. That's what he's saying there. No, he's not. They're not even reading the next sentence. Some even go so far as to claim Paul and the apostles believed the rapture and second coming would happen in their age. No, they didn't. That's illiterate because they're just not even reading again the next sentence in the passage. They refer to a final age, which they define, and you'll see in the next sentence, or generation, which began with Messiah's Time, whether you want to call it the ascension or resurrection, death, birth, whatever. Although Messiah uses the term while he's still alive during his ministry, so probably more so before all of those in his birth would be the defining moment. But it really doesn't matter. Pick one. It started back then. And it is the final age, the final generation of the basically man. Because since Messiah did what he did... The next big event that they anticipated was not even the signs of revelation as much as what happens at the end. Messiah returns. That's the real story here. And that's what we want to understand the most, right? We love to focus on the action movie of Revelation. Indeed, it's in man's nature. However, the next big thing is not Armageddon. It's not... Gog of Magog and all of the many wars. It's, it's not the plagues. It's not the earthquakes. It all leads to Messiah's return, as does the rapture. So don't be troubled, folks, just as Messiah said on this topic. These things must happen. And Paul's saying the same thing here. However, Paul doesn't stop here. He then tells us when the day of Messiah comes in sequence of events. This is not rocket science, folks. And any scholar that doesn't get this is no scholar of the Bible. They may be of their church doctrine or of their denomination or their seminary, but they are not of the Bible. You'll see for yourself. Let no man deceive you by any means. Now, that's the same way Messiah begins Matthew 24's warnings. Why? Because they knew in our age we would be dealing with such false paradigm and even what Scripture calls the strong delusion. We're already in that, folks. we got to figure that mess out now, and we will in this video for this topic. It is amazing how closely Paul follows Messiah, yet we are told he operated somehow against him, against his law, against his Sabbath, against his ways, yet he preached those, he reinforced those, he taught those throughout, and never once did he say the Sabbath has passed away, the law has passed away. No, he said the law is holy, good, and just. He, he, he just They're taking his words out of context, just as Peter warned. But that's a lie. And again, we see the same with the rapture. For that day shall not come. Okay, got that? Not yet. Until, well, until something else happens here. What? Except there come a falling away first. Now, that's going to take a big event for true believers. I'm not talking about wishy-washy Christians who aren't even saved in the first place because it's a relationship. And you don't just fall away from relationship easily. That's a big telltale sign that we haven't seen yet, but we will. And that man of sin be revealed, the son of perdition. Of course, there are dumb channels out there, especially communists, uh, who then say, well, Paul's calling himself the son of perdition here. 
And furthermore, that would mean this happened 2,000 years ago. I mean, it's ridiculous. They can't even think through a sentence. They don't belong teaching the Bible. They don't know it. They don't understand it. And they are just propagandists. Anyway, this has not occurred yet. This is the beast or antichrist or anti-messiah, if you will. When he is revealed, he rises in timeline at the middle of the seven-year tribulation and what is called the Great Tribulation, which starts at that time. But what is Paul defining here? The day of Messiah. Well, what's that? That's not the rapture, right? Oh, no, we'll get there. It's not called the day of Messiah, but we'll get there. It's the day of his return, his second coming, the day of judgment. That's when this occurs, and you'll see this many times in Scripture. These are the same. Paul defines Messiah returns after the Great Tribulation. And he knew this without revelation because it was not written yet. How did he know? Well, you'll see Second Esdras for one. That would be one of the main sources, uh, especially of this kind of prophecy because it stands on its own before the New Testament was written. Wow! And Messiah does define this as well. So you could say he got it either way, but certainly both are representing second esters. Now, who opposeth and exalteth himself above all that is called Elohim, or that is worshipped, so that he, as Elohim, sitteth in the temple of Elohim, showing himself that he is Elohim, right? So there's no question who this is. This is the final beast of Revelation. We've talked about this in some other videos, but we are going to do one specifically on the abomination of desolation coming. The world leader who oppresses the world like no one has before. Pure evil, folks. Now let's go back to the words of Messiah. Matthew 24 Now, we'll start in verse 20. By the way, all these scriptures are from the King James Version. We use Blue Letter Bible specifically uh, when we're doing, you know, putting together our teaching videos. So, you can follow along there, but any King James uh, should pretty much do and should be uh, pretty close, if not exact, the same. But we encourage you to read this whole chapter uh, because Matthew 24 is so super powerful. We'll cover a little bit more uh, throughout this video, so we are going to come back to it. It's about the end times, all of it, pretty much. And here's how verse 20 starts. But pray ye that your flight be not in the winter. Well, why? Well, because who wants to travel in the winter? Winters can be very hard, especially in the area of Israel. Neither on the Sabbath day. Okay, how is it that Messiah invokes the Sabbath day in practice in the very end? How? Well, we'll see that this is the very end, and there's the Sabbath still being kept. Some look for his endorsement of its continuation in utter illiterate ignorance, and he does many times. This is one of those read, rest, the case for Sabbath, and we nail this. For then shall be great tribulation. Wait, but he he couldn't mean that tribulation, right? Not the great tribulation. It's just some arbitrary tribulation, you know, because we can all go through persecution and tribulation at, at any time, right? I mean, let's just redefine everything he just said here. Wrong. Read. Such as, which tribulation? Such as was not since the beginning of the world to this time. No, nor ever shall be. Whoa. Now this is distinct. It can only be what we all term the great tribulation. Anyone trying to redefine that is trying to change the Bible. It's the last three and a half years before the Day of Judgment, because that's what it ends in. But let's deal with this point while we're here on this one. And except those days should be shortened, there should no flesh be saved. Now, you do realize that 
there is flesh saved from the tribulation. Okay, so that means the days have been shortened in the timeline already. Because otherwise no flesh would be saved. But for the elect's sake, those days shall be shortened. Now you realize that means the elect will be going through the Great Tribulation. That's what it means. But we're going to show you that in multiple passages, and you'll see for yourself. Now, some try to stretch basically this out that Messiah just promised. He will make the tribulation even shorter than seven years, or the Great Tribulation shorter than three and a half years. That timeline is in Daniel. But see, here's the problem. It is repeated multiple times times after Messiah's ascension in Revelation. And it doesn't change. It's still three and a half years all the same. His point is already that it is already shortened as three and a half years is a pretty short period in the perspective of history. Now, no one can change that John affirms it again after this so we cannot misunderstand Messiah to say otherwise. Let's not put words in his mouth. We don't need to do that. So we have Yahusha laying out a timeline for the end here. This is important as he progresses beyond this. And where are we? Already at the Great Tribulation, the final three and a half years. That's pretty far in. And we haven't seen a rapture yet, have we? Hmm. Okay, this is the same as we saw in Thessalonians, as Paul and Messiah are on the same page here, and always, and I mean always, are. you got to read Paul and make sure you're doing it in context and with the foundation that he's agreeing. He's never disagreeing with Moses, and he's never disagreeing with Messiah. He's disagreeing with Pharisees, and you need to understand that. He's talking to believers, and he just said, we will still be here. No, not those people physically from 2,000 years ago. They're dead. Believers will still be here during the Great Tribulation. Now, we'll support this many times, many ways. He specifies the elect. His remnant, Ecclesia, will still be here during the Great Tribulation. So if a rapture occurs, it certainly hasn't yet in this passage in time, nor in Paul. Overlooking that would be a massive error for the Son of Yahuwah, would it not? We simply cannot read the Bible as wussies who cower, not wanting to enter suffering of any sort. Tell that to the early ecclesia, fed to the lions in Rome, the bishops of the true church. No, ecclesia, that's the Bible word, all pretty much martyred for the cause as well as the apostles. And you and I are special compared to them. How? Yahusha tells us we will be persecuted and we will suffer for him many times. Who are we to try to redefine that because, well, we don't want it that way. Our opinion is impertinent, and even our lives fleeting and temporary. Just a tiny blip compared to our eternal life after the day of judgment from our relationship with Him, which is all that matters. Not even our physical bodies. They love their lives unto death. That's what Revelation says. Now let's go to Daniel, because that is what Messiah is really quoting here. And that's something that we need to understand. Daniel 12, 1. And at that time shall Michael stand up, the great prince which standeth for the children of thy people. Now that's specifically Israel, right? Notice Michael is not Yahusha. He's not, can't be, doesn't match Scripture in any way, shape, or form. I know there are some who believe that. And there shall be a time of trouble. Now, that is the Great Tribulation. How do we know? Messiah just defined it. He was quoting this, really, basically. Such as, in this part, never was since there was a nation 
He said from the beginning, same thing. Even to that same time, to today, and of course Messiah takes that even further, to the end, ever. So we are in the Great Tribulation here at this point, got that. That's a three and a half year period that ends with Messiah's return on the Day of Judgment, essentially. And that's not questionable. No one could debate that. And at that time, they, thy people shall be delivered. Mm, what time are we in? After the Great Tribulation, folks. That time. After the Great Tribulation, then the people will be delivered. Now, some try to then even redefine that, but you, you can't because <laughs> there are other scriptures that just crush that attempt. Every one that shall be found written in the book. So we're talking about all believers. Yes, we will go through those alive at the time, especially the Great Tribulation. Um, that's what Scripture says, and you'll see. No, this is not saying we are raptured during the Great Tribulation, as we keep reading here. And many of them that sleep in the dust of the earth shall awake. Wait, when does that happen? The resurrection of the dead? Well, this is on the day of judgment. Got to keep our timeline straight. You will see over and over in Scripture. It is not before the tribulation. It is not in the middle of it, but after. Are we sure? Well, keep reading. Some to everlasting life and some to shame and everlasting contempt. What's that? That's the day of judgment. It must be. There are not two judgments in Scripture. You will not find that in this period. Only one. So, we firmly know his people are delivered at the end of the Great Tribulation and not before. Yes, some will die, but there is no rapture yet. Period. Can we be firm on this? Well, Messiah can. And he was. Let's go back to Matthew 24, and this really nails this. Starting in verse 29, Messiah has been talking in this passage of many things, read it all, defining the end times, the tribulation, and the great tribulation, which we just read, and then he says this. Immediately after the tribulation of those days, Whoa, wait, wait, okay, so what tribulation? You mean some indistinct tribulation of another period now? I mean, come on, this could be any time, right? I mean, everyone knows. Yes, we do know, because he's firm. You mean after he just defined this as not on even just the tribulation, but as the great tribulation? <laughs> kind of hard to miss that. Uh, yeah, that doesn't work. One cannot change scripture, yet they certainly try to in interpretation. Not this time. So, what happens now? Shall the sun be darkened, and the moon shall give, not give her light, and the stars shall fall from heaven, and the powers of the heaven shall be shaken. Wow. Where are we? This is also consistent with Revelation. You can go and read that. We're not going to cover everything. Um, and it's also consistent with Second Esdras. And then, when? Immediately after the tribulation. Got it? The tribulation's end point is now. This event shall appear the, son, uh, the sign of the Son of Man in heaven, and then shall all the tribes of the earth mourn, and they shall see the Son of Man coming in the clouds of heaven with power and great glory. Wow. Now, we have his second coming. But is there a second second coming? <laughs> or don't even know what you would call that, right? I guess actually the third coming. Is this the third coming? coming? And, and there's actually a second coming somewhere that, well, Scripture never talks about. So it's just not there. Um, the problem is you will never actually find any scripture to support a second and then third coming. There's just the second coming. That's it. Not a third. It's a doctrine of man, and we will prove this out. You'll see in these two videos especially. 
One other thing on timelines, though. This shows the tribulation of seven years first occurs. Then Messiah returns immediately after, as the defining point, then begins the thousand-year reign, after a few things happen that day especially, as they call it, and Satan is locked away at that point, then he'll be released after a thousand years, but that's much later in the story. That's not what we're going to talk about in this video. Armageddon happens now. During this time frame, not a thousand years later, the final battle takes place at the end of the tribulation. The day of judgment occurs then at this point, not a thousand years later. That is a separate event. Some teach that, but the Bible doesn't. In fact, we'll get that eventually and as a separate video um, because it is a different event. We must keep our timeline straight here to understand the end times. So much happens. Skip to verse 32, the parable of the fig tree. Is this indistinct? Can we not know when this happens? Now learn a parable of the fig tree when its branch is yet tender and putteth forth leaves. Ye know that summer is nigh. So you know the season, right? So likewise, ye, when ye shall see all these things, know that it is near, even at the doors. Verily I say unto you, this generation shall not pass till all these things be fulfilled, completed, made full, not passed away. That is never a definition of the word fulfilled. Those that try to apply it don't speak English clearly. At least they don't understand it. Which generation? Again, you can interpret it two ways if he meant the one standing before him in context. Well, that would make him wrong, right? So that doesn't work. Obviously not. What he meant. He means the final generation, which began then in his time forward, or the final age. However, you can also view this as the subject of uh, this portion of the passage is believers in the very end. Uh, so you could, you could say that their generation will not pass away, perhaps. But over and over in Scripture, this appears far more likely to be a reference to the age of the end, which began from his time forward. Which is why the apostles use the same characterization. Another affirmation of the timeline here. At the end of the Great Tribulation, his people are saved. When is that? The day of judgment. And what else happens? Heaven and earth shall pass away, but my words shall not pass away. Now, odd that he goes there when he used this before. Go read Matthew 5, 17 through 20, because he is confirming that right here. In other words, his commandments is what he's talking about there. His Sabbaths, his feasts remain even then when heaven and earth pass. And that's the day of judgment. Any church telling you these could pass prior to that lost their way indeed. But of that day and hour knoweth no man. Yet we just saw we'll know the season. That's not a day or hour. It's a much more general period. No, not the angels of heaven, but my Father only. So no, we don't know the day or hour. But what did he just say? We will know the season. But as the days of Noah were, so shall also the coming of the Son of Man be. Oh, compare the signs, and you can do that on your own. Many have done that. This is why we cover the flood and the Nephilim. We are seeing these signs even today. The final era of the final eagle head or empire is underway. We have about a century left, folks. And I'll explain. For as in the days that were before the flood, they were eating and drinking, marrying and giving in marriage, until the day that Noah entered into the ark. They were caught off guard, indeed, but Noah was not, 
Remember, he had been building an ark all that time, so he kind of knew something was happening, right? No, he specifically knew that a flood was coming. Hello. It is obvious he already knew about the flood as Yuhua had told him even the details. Maybe not the day, maybe not the hour, but the details. Just as the days of Noah, the remnant ecclesia will know the season of the end judgment. Now, that's how you apply this, right? I mean, we need to be consistent when we're reading here. Same thing. We even dare to break this down in parts 9 through 11 of this series and figure out the rough timing of the end. If you can handle that topic, check those out. It will blow your mind. And knew not until the flood came, who knew not, the others on earth. No one knew, again, perhaps not the day or the hour, all the same if we're being consistent. But he certainly built an ark for something, right? And took them all away. So shall also the coming of the Son of Man be. Unbelievers will be consumed with fire quickly. Now, here's another rapture scripture. Check this out. Then two shall two be in the field. The one shall be taken and the other left. Two women shall be grinding at the mill. The one shall be taken and the other left. Okay, what happened? Were their clothes folded nice and neatly in, uh, you know, a nice little bundle, maybe even packaged with a bow, and they went to heaven all of a sudden? Poof! (laughs) That's nice theater, that's nice Hollywood, but it's not Bible. Okay, so what happened here? What does it mean taken? Well, this is actually pretty obvious. First, where are we in time? Remember that. After the Great Tribulation, right? That's where we are in this text. That is what he says. He didn't change the timeline. Second Esdras is going to explain this a little differently, but even better. But essentially, Messiah returned here now, right? I mean, that's where we are. That's uh, the second coming. On that day, one will be taken and another standing still watching. Where are they taken? Now, we'll deal with that too because Paul tells us. But again, this is after the great tribulation. The one left standing will be consumed with eternal fire. The whole earth is going to be remade, in fact. There's no more time. They can't get saved now, especially since they already took the mark of the beast, more than likely, and I mean like 99.9999999% at that point. Somehow, series like Left Behind not only has the wrong name, the wrong timing, and is inaccurate in most part to Scripture, but it acts as if w- once the rapture happens, people then have time to make a decision. The only way that is even possible is if they did not take the mark. Again, we don't believe hardly any will be left at that point that would not have. And that would render them ineligible, according to Revelation 13, for salvation, period. That whole movie and book series is erroneous. It just messes up theology completely, and it just doesn't happen like that in the Bible. Watch therefore, for ye know not what hour your Lord doth come. But know this, that if a good man of the house had known in what watch the thief would come. In other words, what season. He wouldn't know the day or the hour, but he would know roughly. He's coming this week. He's coming next week. He's coming the end of next week, right? I mean, that would be important in order to prepare. He would have watched and would not have suffered his house to be broken up. So he's even saying, yes, though he comes like a thief in the night, the remnant will know, at least the season, at least roughly, when. Therefore, be ye also ready, for in such an hour as ye think not, the Son of Man cometh. Indeed, again, we don't know the day or hour, but we will know the season. To be ready, knowing the thief is coming. Anybody that's putting a specific day and time and date, they don't know what they're talking about. 
They cannot do that from Scripture, and he makes it clear, and he will not allow them to do that. So we already know they're false prophets if they go in that direction. The context here is exactly that. Back to Paul, and let's see what he has to say further. 1 Thessalonians 4.13 But I would not have you to be ignorant, brethren, concerning them which are asleep, the dead who have passed over all ages, that ye sorrow not, even as others which have no hope, See, those even of the Old Testament who are asleep, yeah, they still have the same hope of Messiah as we. Salvation is not new in the New Testament. No. For if we believe that Yahushua died and rose again, even so, them also which sleep in Yahushua will Elohim bring with him. For this we say unto you by the word of Yahuwah, that we which are alive and remain, what? Say what? Let's read it again. We which are alive and remain unto the coming of Yahushua shall not prevent hmm, them which are asleep. Now, we uncover absolute fraud in the translation. For this word, prevent, <laughs> That's not prevent. That's ridiculous. Consider the timeline here. Again, the day we are in is when? On the day of judgment, at the end of the great tribulation. Notice there will be believers, the remnant ecclesia, still alive in the flesh. That's what it says. That's what Paul's saying right there. They are not among the dead who are asleep. They are alive and remain, he says, until Messiah's second coming, which is when the day of judgment, not before we've covered that. These were not raptured out of the great tribulation. They go through it, and we will as believers, those who are here, of course. Yes, many will even be beheaded even, but you got to have to have your head in order to lose it. Think about it. Therefore, there are, in, in, in physical form, therefore there are uh, basically in the Great Tribulation, uh, those are not raptured. Either that or the Bible is wrong. Well, which is it? Is the Bible wrong? I don't think so. Quickly, let's look at this word interpreted uh, prevent in fraud. And it is. See, this is the length they will go to, they're willing to even change the Bible. It's very disgusting. Fathano, this Greek word does not mean prevent. Look at it. Some translations like the NASB actually get this one right in translation and say precede. But look, to come before. That's not prevent. Precede. Ah, anticipate. These are all before. Or it could mean to come to, arrive at, to reach, attain to. This would be up to that point. So before or up unto the point are the two uses of the word. Now, it really doesn't matter which you use an interpretation. It certainly doesn't mean prevent, number one. And if those survivors of the Great Tribulation do not precede or come before the Day of Judgment, oops, when the dead are raised, that's the context. Or if you want to say up to that point, or in other words, at the same time. Either fits perfect, perfectly because they happen the same day, although the dead do rise first according to Paul. As it is the day of judgment, when the rapture occurs and not before. Some will say, but those are the remnant left over after the rapture, already happened before and became believers during the tribulation. I mean, come on, you've seen the movie, right? Yeah, we have. And the problem is that's not scripture. It is a doctrine of wussies who refuse to accept that we will suffer and go through the tribulation. And we don't escape it according to abundant scripture. Now, we just 
don't. So essentially, this is saying the dead rise first, and then is the rapture, which is both pretty much on the day of judgment, at the very end of the Great Tribulation. Does Scripture support that? Oh, continue. Now, how does this happen? Continuing, 1 Thessalonians 4, 16. Many have asked, what is the order of the end times events? Here we go. This is what happens on the day of judgment, when the rapture occurs. 4. Yahusha himself shall descend from heaven with a shout, with the voice of the archangel, and with the trump of Elohim. That's also called the last trump You'll see in other scriptures. And the dead in Messiah shall rise first. So confirming what we just saw twice, the dead rise before the rapture. And this happens on the day of final judgment. Then we which are alive and remain, there it is again, I mean, which are you? Are you dead or alive? <laughs> Both are there. There are those remnant believers still there in the flesh, meaning they went through the Great Tribulation, and Paul identifies with them as us, basically. The ecclesia continued, which makes sense because that's what it is. Not some odd one-off event that Scripture never mentions where, you know, all the believers were taken from the earth and everything starts over for, you know, a few years and over that time, well, hopefully people will figure out how to get saved. I mean, you know, maybe a preacher will leave a videotape so everybody will know, right? Maybe they'll see a YouTube video. <laughs> Come on. They'll wipe out that stuff, first of all, so you can forget about that. Come on, they, they censor our channel now, So, and we're just covering the Bible. So, shall be caught up together with them in the clouds. Together? We go where? Does it say to heaven? It does not say that. It says we go into the clouds. Now, I know there are technicalities in language. Oh, but that's heaven. It's the sky. It's the... No. No, 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 no. Because you got to remember this part, folks. Let's read who we meet. And he's no longer in heaven because he's already come down. To meet Yahusha in the air. Wait, where is he at this point? He said he came down from heaven on the clouds. That's even prophecy fulfilled. We are meeting him in those clouds, not in heaven. He came down already. We don't go to heaven, and there's no reason why we need to. We meet him in the air. We witness the world being made new, and the judgment, even the consummation of the unrighteous, the fallen angels even. And heaven and earth are made new before our very eyes. Wow! And we see this from the air looking down. He wants us to see it. And so shall we ever be with Yahusha. Wherefore, comfort one another with these words. Not sure he could be any clearer on this. There really is no question and no two ways to read it. Messiah also sets this timing when he tells us of this place called New Jerusalem, which he builds for us. John 14, 1. Let not your heart be troubled. We keep hearing this. Why? Because believers will go through the tribulation. Ye believe in Elohim, believe also in me. In my Father's house are many mansions. If it were not so, I would have told you. I go to prepare a place for you. What is he talking about? Revelation tells us what place which has rooms or mansions for us. New Jerusalem. That is what he prepares, what he builds. And if I go and prepare a place for you, I will come again and receive you unto myself. That where I am there ye may be also. Wow. What is he saying? Time-wise, he is telling us he goes to prepare new Jerusalem for us 
for the end. Anyone that says that his work was finished at the cross is illiterate of Scripture. Because what he is doing now and about to do is even greater by far. He will receive us in the air, we just saw, and New Jerusalem, we'll watch, then comes down from heaven. Wow. And this thing is thousands of miles across. Amazing. Now, we don't go to heaven. It comes down. In fact, Revelation says it rolls back as a scroll, right? And then heaven comes to earth. Well, same thing. Wow. Let's look at how this happens. Revelation 3.12, him that overcometh. Who's that? It's those that overcome through the tribulation. Will I make a pillar in the temple of my Elohim, and he shall go no more out, and I will write upon him the name of my Elohim and the name of the city of my Elohim, which is New Jerusalem, which cometh down out of heaven from my Elohim, and I will write upon him my new name. Wait, what happens now? New Jerusalem, for the second time, comes down from heaven. And at a specific time. Let's see when that happens. But we abide there with Messiah. Not in heaven. Revelation 21, verse 2. And I saw a new heaven and a new earth. Now we know where we are on the timeline, right? This is the day of judgment, essentially. For the first heaven and the first earth were passed away. They are remade, replenished, just as the earth was before in the flood. But this time completely purified with everlasting, eternal fire, and rid of evil. And there was no more sea. That's right, the ocean is gone, and the ancient rivers from Eden on the bottom of the ocean floor revealed again. Watch that series for more. And I, John, saw the holy city, New Jerusalem, coming down from Elohim out of heaven prepared as a bride adorned for her husband. Wow. Ah, so, New Jerusalem comes down on the Day of Judgment. Again, this could take days of time, perhaps. I keep saying day, and yes, maybe it could be days, it could be weeks, uh, it could be the feast cycle, in fact. Uh, many believe that. Uh, so we're looking at basically within the seventh month. But regardless, it doesn't matter uh, whether it's exactly, you know, this many days or whatever. The point is, this all happens consecutively and in order. So, now, um, what we know is this is after the Great Tribulation. We are raptured into the air, not heaven. We view to the clouds. We view the replenishing of the earth, and then New Jerusalem comes down. Messiah receives us in the air, and then we go into New Jerusalem to be with him forever. After a thousand years, let's just finish uh, a little bit. I'm not going to cover this in this video, but we've had some questions, so let's answer it. After a thousand years, from that point, then Satan will be loosed again to tempt us once again. He'll fail, and this time he will be gone forever. Also in Revelation 14, 2, John defines believers living through the tribulation. Here is the patience of the saints. Why? They are living through the tribulation at this point in patience, awaiting the end. Here are they that keep the commandments of Elohim. Yep, still keeping his commandments and his Sabbath and his feasts to the end. This is what his remnant ecclesia will do. We must restore this now. And the faith of Yahusha. See, that goes hand in hand. This is the definition of faith and works, which is salvation. The works are keeping his commandments, which have never changed. They are not salvation. They are a sign and accompany salvation.
Salvation is relationship. And in having a relationship, this is what we do. And I heard a voice from heaven saying unto me, Write, Blessed are the dead which die in Yahushua from henceforth. So we are in the tribulation, and saints are still dying physically. There it is. Yea, saith the Spirit, that they may rest from their labors. What they were working on earth, really? Well, you're not supposed to do works, right? <laughs> yes, it requires faith and works, as faith without works is dead. And their works do follow them. What works? Keeping his commandments. One last scripture for this video, and we will recap and continue in the next. 1 Corinthians 15, 51. Behold, I show you a mystery. We shall not all sleep. <laughs> Did you read that? Not everyone will die. That's what it means. Can we read? It, it's been there all along. But we shall all be changed, even those who are alive. As we already read, Scripture is very clear. Some will be, because they'll go through the tribulation. In a moment, in the twinkling of an eye at the last trump, that is the final day of judgment and not before. For the trumpet shall sound and the dead shall be raised incorruptible. We know that time stamp, and we know when it occurs, and that that occurs first. And we shall be changed. Who's we? Those who are raptured into the air. Those who are physically alive still. Yes, they still die at that point, as it is appointed for all men to die, just as Enoch and Elijah will die then, but in a twinkling of an eye. Go ahead, you can practice that. How fast can you blink? There you go, that's how fast it will happen. We then are given new bodies, those raised from the dead who were asleep, believers, and those of us that still remain in the flesh. For this corruptible must put on incorruption. Understand what that means. We get a new body. What we have is corrupted. And scriptures made that clear Many times we've covered that, especially in Answers and Jubilees, uh, when we talked about the 120-year uh, lifetime limit of man uh, in our age. And this mortal must put on immortality, well, a new body which can live forever. Again, when does this happen? On the day of judgment, at the second coming of Messiah, and not before. So let's get this down to a recap so far. We will be raptured, but when, according to Scripture? These ain't just a few passages, folks. This is a no-brainer, and any scholar claiming to know the word proves themselves illiterate if they don't see this. It should smack them in the head, yet they continue to spout paradigms as they are trained in seminaries. Enough of that. That is how we are enslaved. The rapture happens after the beast is revealed. Of course, we find more specifics, but that rules out the so-called pre-trib and mid-trib rapture theories, which are unbiblical and have no justification in Scripture. They're doctrines of men. At the last trump, which is after the great tribulation, just at the very end of it, this is the defining day, basically, where it ends and the Day of Judgment begins, at least the process. And then Messiah nails it after the Great Tribulation. I'm sorry, what are they debating? <laughs> There's nothing to debate. Scripture is clear. After the tribulation of those days, what days? The last days, the Great Tribulation. After the sun and moon are darkened, hasn't happened yet, you don't have to worry about being raptured yet. After all the stars fall, have you seen all of these things happen? Nope, you haven't. <laughs> then we shouldn't need to be looking for the rapture yet. 
after essentially all the signs of Matthew 24, which is the time of tribulation. What's that? The day of judgment. That's what it defines the end, though it is our new beginning. We keep using the word end because that's what the Bible uses. But the reality is it is our new beginning. It is a good thing. After the dead in Messiah rise first, and that happens when? On the day of judgment. After or at the time of, same day, heaven and earth are made new. That's the day of judgment, and then you see that happen. And again, it's timed with the second coming, it's all together. And it is after the patience of the saints through the tribulation period. This all leads to the same end, and it cannot be some random event that happens, well, at some time, who knows when, nobody knows. Yes, we do. We know the season. We can, and we certainly know the timeline of Revelation, so we know its order of events. And the last days, as it is so well spelled out for us. The notion that pulpits out there are claiming the rapture could happen at any moment is outright unbiblical, and in the face of all of this so far, and we're only halfway through the passages, wow. You know, Peter said it best, willing ignorance defines our era, folks. Is the wussy way the better way? No. But I don't want to suffer in face persecution. Yet Messiah says, you will for me and for my sake. You can't make that go away, of course. You can take the mark of the beast and serve Satan if you want. But if you are with him, well, you will be persecuted, and some even martyred, because that's the way it works. In fact, that is what will define you as a true believer in the end. This is just fact. Hard fact, yes, but the truth. Are we prepared? Do we realize why we must prepare now? We must deepen our relationship with him. That is salvation, and nothing else. We must put on our full armor, not run out into the battle naked with only a helmet of salvation, because that's the only part that's salvation. And in this case, many, well, they're going to learn theirs is just plastic anyway, because they're following a false definition of salvation not found in Scripture. It's not a prayer. It is a relationship. This is serious, and he ain't playing. Again, read Matthew 7, and he's very clear that he's going to turn away Christians in the end. That should wake all of us up. The world was made for the righteous, not in perfection, but in relationship. Yes, he is forgiving. The unrighteous, however, those who have chosen unrighteousness as a lifestyle, they will simply disappear. Even their spirits, they will be gone because there is no place on his earth for the unrighteous. The new day comes when evil will be gone. I say this with a heavy heart, yet a hopeful one, that those who have made it this far into this video, and hopefully next as well, We'll do exactly that. Focus on relationship with him over all else. We know many of you will, and we are glad you are here. I know our direct approach is different from what you hear in church, and my friends, you're welcome, because we already uh, are getting close. We're about a century away if you watch parts 9 through 11 and test that out for yourself. And it's time to get serious. It's time to prepare. Next, we will cover 2nd Esdras, which also deals with these end times events, 400 years before Messiah, and you're going to see the origin of Revelation, of Messiah's words there, of Paul's words, really, much of the time. We hope you have all learned, or at least confirmed, as I know many of our viewers already know the rapture doctrine 
of most of the church is false. We'll seal this next. We have over 300 videos, almost 350 now, on this channel, many just as profound with some 50 or so in Tagalog for Filipinos. Don't forget to like and subscribe and click the bell for notifications of new uploads. Join our email list as YouTube, well, they just forget to notify often. And, well, we will notify you ourselves at thegodculture.com. Just fill in the pop-up. And friend us on Facebook at The God Culture, space hyphen space, original. We now have five books published internationally, being read in over 80 countries and still growing, with our new release now available, Rest, the 400-plus page case for Sabbath. Just go to uh, restsabbath.org for that or ophirinstitute.com our main site for all of our books and you'll find them all there uh, you can go to bookofjubilees.org and to esdras.org as well if you want those specifically all the links are there for your area and you can download the ebook for free so thank you for watching now always remember prove all things for yourself Yah bless to everyone. In 400 BC, the prophet Ezra predicted, For my son Yahusha shall be revealed with those that be with him, and they that remain shall rejoice within 400 years. Essentially, 0 BC, the era Messiah was born, and by his very name, in exactness. After these years shall my son Messiah die, and all men that have life. The origin of John 3.16 And the time shall be when these things shall come to pass, and the signs shall happen which I showed you before. And then shall my son be declared, whom you saw 
as a man ascending. Even the end times are defined long before the book of Revelation. The son of Elohim being confessed in the world. After seven days, the world will be raised up. Mass resurrection of those who are asleep. The judgment seat. Evil will disappear. The Lion of Yehuda will consume the final empire, consuming his enemies with fire from his mouth. The lost tribes return. Every eye shall see him handing out crowns and giving palms. The road to salvation is a narrow gate. Few are saved. The Garden of Eden and the Tree of Life are opened in the end. He is not willing that any should perish. The signs of the end times and origin of Matthew 24 in part. These are just some of the many prophecies in the book of 2 Esdras, long before the book of Revelation was conceived. Second Ezra, written before John's revelation. This is the interpretation of the dream which you saw, and whereby you only are here lightened. For you have forsaken your own way, and applied your diligence unto my law, and sought it. That's Yahuwah speaking to the prophet Ezra. Second Ezra is dated at least 1st century B.C., as it is used to interpret Habakkuk and blessing of the prince of the congregation who is Messiah. This includes a radiocarbon dating testing uh, as well of one fragment from 120 to 5 B.C. We cover this in the introduction. This book includes 1st Esdras as well, which is also dated to the 1st century BC, when one examines what is called in fraud the Proto-Ester fragments from the Dead Sea Scrolls, which do not remotely fit Esther, but are a match to 1st Esdras. We cover this in the introduction of this book, as well as on our YouTube uh, videos on Esther in the original canon series. Second Esdras was quoted by Messiah according to the original authorized 1611 King James Version. Matthew 23, 37, and 38 is a direct quote from Second Esdras. Esdras, which is anchored right there in the margin note as the origin of Messiah's words. For Esdras is second Esdras, which we explain in the introduction. Yes, he quoted second Esdras multiple times. When accurately dated, 2nd Esdras proves the origin of significant doctrine in the New Testament. We cover many such instances in the introduction. There is a reason why these two books remain in some Bible canons to this day. They test as inspired scripture. Test them for yourself. Get your copy now, free in ebook. Again, this content is free. If you would like it in print, it is available on Amazon internationally and Shopee Philippines. Just go to toesdras.org. Download the ebook, and the links are there for your area.